Hello and welcome to the Irish Aesthete. Today I want to begin talking to you about architectural structures that have come to be known as follies. Probably the easiest way to define a folly is to think of a building that serves no discernible purpose except to look decorative. There have probably always been follies built, but they really came into their own in this country and elsewhere during the 18th and 19th centuries. An excellent example of this phenomenon is the obelisk. Dating back some 4,000 years, obelisks are tapered four-sided columns. They originated in ancient Egypt, where they symbolised the sun god Ra and stood in pairs outside temple entrances. Most of them are around 60 to 70 feet tall, but the highest stands outside St John Lateran in Rome, rising 105 feet into the air. There are no less than 13 old obelisks in Rome, because once Egypt had become part of its territories, different emperors had examples shipped across the Mediterranean and re-erected around the city. While many of these fell down and were damaged during the Middle Ages, from the 16th century onwards, successive popes arranged to have them reinstated, as is the case with the red granite obelisk, which now stands in the centre of St Peter's Square. Originally erected in the Egyptian city of Heliopolis, it had been brought to Rome on the instructions of the Emperor Caligula. Then there's this much smaller, rather adorable, red granite obelisk in the Piazza Santa Maria, placed on top of an elephant by artist and architect Gian Lorenzo Bernini in the 1660s. Other examples of ancient Egyptian obelisks can be seen in Paris, in the centre of the Place de la Concorde. This was actually given to the French in the 1830s by the then ruler of Ottoman Egypt, Muhammad Ali Pasha, in exchange for a mechanical clock, which then didn't work. Its pair still stands outside the temple at Luxor. And of course, there's Cleopatra's needle on London's embankment, which, although offered to the British government in 1819, didn't actually arrive in England until almost 60 years later. Here in Ireland, sadly, we don't have any original Egyptian obelisks, but we do have a number of examples of them built as follies when this craze caught on from the early 18th century onwards. The first of these, designed if not erected in 1727, can be found in Stillorgan, now a suburb of South Dublin, but then in open countryside on an estate belonging to Joshua, 2nd Viscount Allen. He and his wife Margaret are believed to have commissioned the work from the architect Edward Lovett Pierce, its design at least in part inspired by Bernini's Fountain of the Four Rivers in Rome's Piazza Navona. In Stillorgan, Pierce raised the cut stone obelisk onto a rusticated base which features a chamber in which visitors could sit while flights of steps around the same base provided them with views of the surrounding grounds and out to the Irish Sea. The Stillorgan Obelisk still stands, albeit today surrounded by housing estates. Obviously, the most remarkable use of the obelisk motif in Ireland, indeed perhaps anywhere, can be found in County Kildare. This is the Connolly Folly, which for many years has been the emblem of the Irish Georgian Society. Erected to provide relief to the poor of the area after the severe frosts and ensuing famines of 1740-41, the folly was commissioned by wealthy widow Catherine Connolly, who lived in Castletown. The site on which it stands is exactly two miles to the rear of the house, on land which Mrs Connolly didn't actually own. It belonged to the Fitzgeralds, Earls of Kildare, from whom she had to get permission for its construction. Its design attributed to architect Richard Castle, the folly perfectly lives up to its name, having no function whatsoever except to surprise and delight. The base of the obelisk is composed of a series of diminishing stone arches, some of which have curved tops with pineapples above, and others columns with stone eagles sitting on urns. The whole thing rises 70 feet and then comes the obelisk climbing a further 70 feet. 
Incidentally, Marika Guinness, co-founder of the Irish Children's Society, who died in May 1989, is buried beneath the central arch of the folly. For sheer eccentricity and chutzpah, nothing could hope to beat the Connolly folly. But when it comes to the use of obelisks in follies of beauty, to my mind, another one wins first prize. This can be found in the grounds of Gloucester, County Offaly, which also happens to be one of my favourite houses in Ireland. It's very much a folly as eye-catcher, since it stands on high ground to one side of the building and is approached via a sequence of fish ponds. Built of rubble stone, the folly was probably another work by Edward Lovett Pierce, related to the Lloyd family who then lived at Gloucester, and it can therefore be dated to the late 1720s, early 1730s. You can see that the central section is composed of an arch with an oculus in the pediment. This is flanked by obelisks, each of which has niches in its plinth. The Gloucester Folly used to be in rather poor shape, but has been wonderfully restored in recent years, as you can see here. I'm very happy to say that a charity of which I'm a trustee, the Apollo Foundation, helped to fund this vital work. Let's finish with another pair of obelisks, albeit on a more modest scale. They can be found at Dangan, County Meath, which in the 18th century was the country estate of the Wellesleys, Earls of Mornington. The Duke of Wellington was a son of this family. According to Isaac Butler, writing in the mid-1740s, there were originally 25 obelisks in the grounds of Dangan, but today only two of them survive. This one, of brick and raised on a stone base, is now a truncated stump. But its sibling, not far away, is in better condition, having been restored thanks to the enterprise of local resident Christopher Gray in 2015 to mark the 200th anniversary of the Battle of Waterloo, at which, of course, the Duke of Wellington triumphed. And there we'll leave it for today. In the next episode, I want to look at another kind of folly which was once widespread across the Irish countryside. I look forward to seeing you then. Thank you so much for watching The Irish Aesthete. Goodbye. Thank you.